Hi. <laughs> Long time no see. Good morning. Welcome to the ETSU Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Today we welcome Dr. James Holt, who is a professor in the Department of Family Medicine here at ETSU. Dr. Holt attended Princeton University, receiving an AB in biochemistry. He completed his um, medical school training at the University of Maryland and his residency training um, in family medicine at MUSC in Charleston. Um, after completing that, he was in private practice from 85 up until 2001 when he joined the faculty um, here um, in the family practice residency program. Today his topic um, is going to be the assessment and treatment of delirium psychosis and agitation in dementia. Welcome. Thank you. Um, when Dr. Moore asked me to do something in dementia, I pretty much gave him a choice of what I could cover and uh, he gave me the easy stuff. So. This is, this is problematic for everybody. I mean, you don't have to feel bad in any particular area for um, treatment of behaviors in dementia because at this point, we really don't have anything that's very effective. And what I'll be doing is presenting some cases that are real cases, so you can ask me questions about them afterwards, um, but also trying to give you an idea of how to manage and we'll actually be acting out a scenario or two at the end. So. Um, I do not have any financial disclosures. Um, sometimes I wish I did, but I, not really. I wouldn't want to do that. All right. Our goal is to better manage difficult complications of dementia. And the objectives will kind of flesh that out a little bit. I want you to be familiar with the confusion assessment method. 
which is a very quick screening tool that you can use to identify delirium in demented patients. You can use it for any suspected delirium, but uh, as you probably know, delirium is much more common in demented patients. Um, and I'm also going to uh, talk about a systematic approach to uh, treatment of delirium. Basically what that means is that the treatment for delirium is to uh, modify as many of the reversible risk factors for delirium and contributors to delirium as you can and see if it will clear. Um, we'll talk about behavioral hob options for the treatment of agitation in demented patients. That's what our scenarios will be about. And we'll talk about detecting and managing psychotic symptoms in demented patients. Now that's a little more challenging. Okay, first case. This is a lady I actually took care of in the hospital about two months ago. Um, she's an 86-year-old woman who's had a long history of Parkinson's um, and chronic kidney disease from um, uh, east of Elizabethton, so hadn't really been to medical doctors very often. Um, and we admitted her on unassigned call to JCMC, um, I believe it was September, but I'm, I'm not certain. Um, she came in with acute on kidney, on chronic kidney injury and dehydration. And she also reported in the review of systems uh, hard swallowing. And I, I really didn't know what she meant by that, so I asked her to clarify that. And what she said is when she tried to drink water, she had to repeat her swallowing two or three times. Didn't feel like it was going. Um, and because of that, she hadn't been drinking very well. Water was her preferred drink, and she wasn't taking as much. Um, so I was the hospitalist. I ordered IV fluids, swallowing evaluation, and a repeat chest. But um, unsurprisingly, um, the patient had difficulty that night. Um, basically, what had happened is, um, as unfortunately frequently happens at John City Medical Center, they, they took her for her imaging um, fairly late. Uh, it was dark already. Um, she came back from the chest x-ray after she had eaten dinner and gone to radiology, and she became more painful, was how it was reported to the resident. Um, that she was hurting especially in her back, she had complained of chronic back pain, she was not on opioids, which is a little different for most of our patients on unassigned call. Um, but she also seemed to be mentally different, not as sharp as she had been when she came in. Um, the nurse particularly noticed that she was wandering off uh, in her conversation, couldn't attend to the same topic for more than a minute or two. Um, the request to the resident was for a medicine for pain and for some Ativan, which was given, and she became significantly worse after doing that. So, what would you do? Any brave souls? Yeah, resident did do that. She was on Cinemet and um, at this point in antibiotic and IV fluids, primarily. Um, she had not really been going to doctors much. She wasn't being treated really for hypertension or kidney disease. Her creatinine, if I recall, was about 2.8 at that point. Now, it, it went up further, but it was about 2.8 at that point. We had no baseline. Potassium was up about 5, 5.1. Yeah, otherwise the lights were fine. Okay, suggestions? White cell, blood cell count was elevated, about 15,000. Now that you can see that with dehydration, but it's a little bit high for that. Good idea. Suggestion was your analysis. Basically, at this point, you want to start looking for what is contributing to the patient's presentation. So, so you want diagnoses. You want to know what you're treating. So I would argue 
that because of the circumstances, delirium is very likely. You're seeing somebody who can't focus on the same topic for more than a minute or two. You're seeing an acute mental status change in somebody at risk for delirium, and it fits. So your working diagnosis probably in terms of mental status should be delirium. Um, if you want to uh, make the diagnosis, though, I would suggest you use this confusion assessment method, and that's our next slide. Um, pulled it right off of uh, Essential Evidence Plus. Um, she also had um, uh, an adverse drug reaction, didn't she, to the pain medicine and to the Ativan. Now, any 86-year-old patient can have that, um, but if you're worried about a delirium being triggered by that, then you want to start thinking about why would those medicines do that. Um, and her vital signs had changed. Now, this was subtle because she came in with a baseline temp of about 96-something. And she was up to about, I think, 98.8 at this point in the middle of the night. Um, her pulse was up, though, and her respirations were up. So. What is your differential diagnosis in addition to delirium? What else are you worried about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, doing a lot of nursing home medicine, um, when patients had this kind of presentation, I kind of thought at Casablanca round up the usual suspects. It's almost always something respiratory or something in the, in the urine. Um, other infections were actually quite uncommon in that population, other than some skin and soft tissue, which usually didn't give the systemic uh, symptoms. All right. All right, this is the CAM. This is what you'll get if you um, pull it off of Essential Evidence Plus. This is very closely paralleling the DSM-4 criteria for delirium. And I looked at DSM-5, it's not greatly different, but the wording's a little more um, distant from this. Uh, so basically, you have to have one and two and one of the options in three for this. So you have to have the acute change and fluctuating course, and you've got to have the inattention, which she did have. Um, she also, when the resident tested her, did have uh, unclear flow of ideas, did have some disorientation. So she met the criteria for delirium. Um, there is a typo on this, though, that I noted this morning, and um, this is the presentation I sent before. It should be disorientation to year, day, or week, or type, or, or place. So. OK, this is what happened to her. Uh, she went up from a subtle increase in her temp to a very overt increase in her temp. And after hydration, she had developed an infiltrate. Um, she didn't have anything that we could find that was triggering the back pain, and back pain was chronic. It's just it was much, much worse when she was delirious. She was complaining of it bitterly. Um, she did have a urine culture that was positive, um, and she did improve uh, with daylight, uh, but didn't go to baseline. So what does that make you think of? What's that term? Sundowning. Yeah. You know, so maybe there's an element of dementia. So we did have to give her pain medicines because she was writhing around with pain. Um, and uh, we did find other causes of delirium besides the pain medicines. We didn't feel that we could withhold the pain medicines and make her delirium better because severe pain is also a trigger for delirium. But she did have um, a bit of an impaction. Um, we avoided waking her for vital signs and transporting her during the night from that point. Um, and uh, we started her on antibiotics for, that would cover both pneumonia and UTI. She actually hadn't been started on antibiotics the first afternoon. Uh, we asked the family to keep somebody with her. Now, that's, that's a, a strategy that's used in England uh, pretty commonly. They don't actually use antipsychotics in Dalaran. What they do is they bring in an attendant. Um, they tend to have better outcomes. Um, but the poor man's version in the U.S. is if there's a family member who's willing to stay at, during the night, 
that's what you have them do. Um, and you have to have some lighting, but you also have to try to preserve the day-night cycle. So generally what you do at night is keep the lights on but keep them low so that the patient can recognize their family member um, if they awaken. Um, we continued rehydrating, that was her primary treatment, and we had speech therapy uh, evaluate her and they did find um, some risk of aspiration of thin liquids. So the thinnest liquid, of course, is water, and that's what the patient was having difficulty swallowing. So her Parkinson's had led to some difficulty with swallowing and aspiration. Um, and on cognitive testing, she did have early Parkinson's dementia. You don't see a lot of Parkinson's dementia because it's rare to occur less than 10 years. It's usually 15 to 20 years where you see it. It's an end stage kind of complication. And in her case, uh, she had had it for 15 years. So take home points about a delirious patient. Um, the estimate um, is that 70% of elderly patients admitted to the hospital developed delirium. Uh, there have been some surveys that back up that kind of number. The actual diagnosis that's made in the hospital is usually on the order of 15%. Uh, so there's this huge gap of people who have inattention and uh, a less sharp mental status that we're not picking up. Um, I would recommend that you pull up the confusion assessment method to diagnose delirium when you're not sure, um, and that there's a lot of things in the hospital that exacerbate it. Just being in the hospital is a risk factor. This lady especially, since she had almost no um, interactions with the medical system. You treat it by treating all the reversible causes that you can. Um, in LW's case, we didn't stop her pain medicines, but we treated everything else that we could. Um, she didn't get any more Ativan. Um, and if you have to use a medication acutely, uh, the medication of choice is an antipsychotic, it's haloperidol. Um, but you really try to avoid that because all you're doing with that is sedating the patient. Um, and as I commented, we treated impaction, UTI, pneumonia, and aspiration to try to reverse her de delirium. Okay, do you think there's any, um, any uh, possibility that you can prevent delirium? You have this patient who seemed to have it triggered by going to x-ray her first night. Is this something that's likely to work? What would you do? Has anybody seen anything on that? Preserve the day-night cycle, yeah. Familiar objects, yes, and familiar people. That's why we brought the family member in. Yeah, I think you're on the right track. There actually was a good study done on this. Um, it was well-designed, 852 patients, 70 or above, admitted just onto the general medical floors. And what they did Bullet two is they try to work on these six risk factors. Cognitive impairment, they kept them on their cholinesterase inhibitor, they treated as, as adequately as they could. They tried to make sure that they had the day-night cycle and had an opportunity to sleep without being wakened. Um, they tried to uh, have their walkers or ambulation aids available along with staff to assist them to the bathroom. Um, they made sure they had their glasses, <laughs> they made sure they had their hearing aids, um, and they tried to make sure that they had adequate hydration, IV if, ne if necessary. Um, and what happened is they reduced the incidence of delirium by one-third. So the best we can do is to reduce the incidence of delirium by one-third. It did not affect the severity, it didn't affect the course. But we cut it by about a third. Now, there's also a medication that recently has come out with possibility of prevention for delirium. Yes? Yeah, that's my next slide. Good segue. Um, what can you tell me about that? Hmm? 
Well, the, the design's a little bit interesting, and this is a study that's going to have to be confirmed. But it's the first medication, really, that's shown any significant benefit in terms of preventing delirium. Uh, Rumeltian is a derivative of melatonin. It's um, used as a sleep aid. Um, in primary care, I've got to tell you, I, I don't consider it incredibly effective. Um, it does help with sleep phase disorders, and it does help sometimes in the elderly, um, where less effective medicines sometimes show more. But the way they set this up, and the, the problem that I have, is they used a highly um, anticholinergic med as their PRN for insomnia. So I wonder if the patients who got Rameltian got less hydroxyzine. Um, if you use hydroxyzine, anybody prone to any kind of mental status change, then that highly anticholinergic drug is going to cause problems. So I, I have a little problem with the setup, with the design of this study. But there was a clear result. Number needed to treat three um, to um, reduce the incidence of delirium. So this is very promising. There's another promising drug I'm going to show you about um, agitation, too. Um, but at this point, I think it has to be confirmed. I don't have any problem with people trying it. Um, it certainly makes sense. It's a very benign drug. Um, but I, I don't think it's proven. OK. Um, interestingly, they've done a lot more research on um, preventing delirium in surgical patients than they have in medical patients. I guess the surgeons don't want to deal with that, but I wouldn't think that the medical people would want to deal with it either. Um, it's just the research hasn't been done very well. Um, and non-pharmacologic interventions are more effective than meds at this point, despite the Rumeltian study that's out. Um, and unfortunately, using medications to treat delirium is not very promising. There's, there's really very shaky evidence that haloperidol might help some. Um, but what you're doing is you're, you're sedating without making the delirium worse. If you use an opioid, you make the delirium worse. If you use a benzo, you make the delirium worse. Um, the antipsychotic doesn't appear to acutely make the delirium worse, but you have an increased death rate. So. OK, second case. This was a patient I had at the nursing home um, probably about seven or eight years ago. She was very, very difficult. Um, she had been moved down to the area um, by her family because she was the last one up north. And um, she came down when she was really floridly psychotic with Lewy body dementia. So um, it was very difficult. My initial evaluation was, honest to God, this. Um, you know, I'm there talking to her. She's answering a few questions. And then she just flips out. Um, and she thought she was falling off a train. Um, this is another one, also from the same nursing home, who um, had, he was actually a World War II veteran. This was actually probably about 13, 14 years ago. Um, but I put in Korea War because it wouldn't fit right now for World War II. Um, and he actually was reliving battles during the time he was in the nursing home, moving around in his room. He was actually physically fairly good. He was pretty heavy. But other than that, he had hypertension and, and not much else. Um, but he was reliving battles. And we weren't really sure why he was so much worse in the nursing home than he'd been at the assisted living. OK. So how about use of antipsychotics in Lewy body dementia or Alzheimer's disease? What's the evidence show? Anybody know? I won't argue that point. The answer is that uh, in Lewy body dementia, it worsens. Pardon? Um, yes. Um, do you know why? Because it has less affinity for the um, 
for the dopamine receptor. Um, so it's actually a less effective antipsychotic at lower, especially at lower doses. Um, but yes, it's it's the labeled drug of choice if you're going to use an antipsychotic in Lewy body, but um, it still makes it worse. Um, and in Alzheimer's, there's mixed evidence, as was said. Okay, so the recommendation, because of that mixed evidence, is that you should try to avoid antipsychotics if you can. Um, and the situation where you can't is non-pharmacologic options have failed and the patient is a threat to self or others. So in other words, an acute break. Um, somebody who's agitated is going to hit people or is at harm to himself. Um, the risk of that is a new antipsychotic prescription um, in the first 90 days. There's a hazard ratio for death of 2.39. Okay, that's compared to not using the antipsychotic. Um, and all antipsychotics carry a black box warning for increased mortality in demented elderly. We had a really interesting week in April of 2006 in geriatrics because the same week the initial um, study came out showing that um, risperidone and olanzapine had a mild benefit in agitation in elderly demented patients with Alzheimer's disease. That Friday came out the black box warning that the relative risk of death was 1.8 for using any antipsychotics in demented patients. So we had the reason to use it and the reason not to use it come out in the same week. Yeah. Okay, the point is that a patient who is um, acutely psychotic in the hospital has many other reasons that they could have mortality in the first 90 days. Fair? Um, the, the study that I quoted um, in terms of the black box warning was this huge meta-analysis, and that actually factored out those increased mortality risk, and the hazard ratio is 1.8. So you're right, it's not quite as dire as it appears, but it is still an 80% increased death rate. Okay? The problem that we have is that most of the patients who are started in this setting are not in the hospital. They're in the nursing home or they're in assisted living. And um, there, what tends to happen is the medicine tends to be kept on. Um, and that definitely does cause numbers like this. But your point is fair. Okay, um, so the problem with Lewy body dementia is that psychosis is part of the condition. As a matter of fact, the most common presentation of Lewy body dementia is not dementia. It's not memory loss. What it is is um, visual hallucinations. And my classic patient for that, I was in private practice in South Carolina, and um, a woman came in with her daughter and started talking about the little green men she saw crawling over everything outside of her house. The cars, the houses, the lawns. And she said to me, I know that's not real, but I see them. She tested absolutely normal on her men mini mental status. Um, within five years, she had gone through this raging psychosis in the nursing home and, and had died. Um, bad disease. But it presents with recurrent visual hallucinations, usually of mute animals or people. It's not really uncommon to have auditory hallucinations with it. But you know, by any other definition, that's psychosis. If she, you know, the people were 25, you would treat them for schizophrenia. Um, because antipsychotics make Lewy body dementia worse, 
then the recommendation is only to treat hallucinations which are distressing. Now, my patient definitely had distressing hallucinations. She was thinking there was a tragedy every few seconds. Um, this treatment, believe it or not, all I could find was four single trials, and the largest trial was 50 patients. They weren't all antipsychotics. Um, uh, two of them were cholinesterase inhibitors, which may have a slight benefit. Olanzapine might have a slight benefit. But you know how those little trials are. A reported slight benefit is probably nothing. Um, and uh, no medicine was clearly effective. Um, if you use levodopa for the motor functions in Lewy body dementia, you make the psychosis worse. Um, and I did throw that thing in about Chinese medicine because I'd never heard of that stuff, but um, it apparently is as good as anything that we've developed pharmacologically in this country. There was a trial of using Seroquel for Lewy body dementia hallucinations, and it showed no benefit. Um, a similar trial of olanzapine did show a possible slight benefit, but it was actually smaller. So it was like on the order of 15 to 20 patients. Um, the problem with olanzapine is there's no question that it seriously worsens the Parkinson's features of Lewy body dementia. Um, the increased mortality for antipsychotic Antipsychotic use is also true for um, Lewy body dementia. Um, and for that reason, the recommendation is limit use of antipsychotics in Lewy body dementia only to crises. Short use, um, transition to some other form of management after the crisis. So what do we do with this lady? This lady did have distressing hallucinations. I think you'll agree. Um, and she was on a boatload of antipsychotics when I got her from New York State. Um, I tried to actually increase those when I met her. Um, and it had no effect other than she had more side effects, unsurprisingly. So then what I did is I slowly weaned the antipsychotics. It seemed to make absolutely no difference. It didn't affect her in any way. Um, and what we tried were more behavioral techniques, you know, um, trying to be there for her when she thought she had fallen off a train trestle, um, but not trying to treat that with medications. Um, and essentially, her Lewy body dementia course seemed to be unchanged by anything we did with medicines. Now, this is the new drug for agitations. Has anybody heard of Nudexta before? Yeah, it's get, getting heavily marketed for labile affect. Um, but uh, this trial of 220 patients was done to look at agitation in Alzheimer's, which hasn't been used before. They used a sequential parallel design. So what that meant is three were on plus, uh, Three were on drug and four were on placebo, the first part. Then they took half of the people on placebo and put them on the drug, the second part. So it's actually a, a, similar to a crossover design, which strengthens the um, statistical um, uh, significance of the results. Um, they did each stage for five weeks. So there were two stages of five weeks. They used PRN lorazepam, which I think, unfortunately, is probably a weakness of the study. Um, but they did see a significant benefit to the drug in both stages. Um, the magnitude was less than what the authors had put in initially as what they consider a significant difference. So not a super strong article, but um, hopefully it will be confirmation of this, because this study design was not as difficult as the first one had been. OK, what can you do with behavior for psychosis and agitation? There's been a lot of study of this. Um, it actually has better results than drugs do, but that's unfortunately not saying a whole bunch because drugs are so ineffective. Um, but the simplest thing is the first point there. You know, During the day, they should be able to see. So turn the lights up. Um, put their hearing aids on. Have less distractions. Have less noise out in the hall. Um, Decrease the clutter in the nursing home rooms. 
Um, there's this snow elizin, which I've actually run into before when I've done the chapter on Alzheimer's disease, um, which I've actually never seen other than pictures of it. But they have a room that controls light, color, sounds, music, scents, and surfaces to try to get all their senses to be consonant with a calming influence. And that does seem to help, but it's not going to be widely available by any means. You want to reward civil behavior. You know, when they're doing well, you want to, you want to engage. Um, you want to redirect them. Now, we'll show what that looks like in the scenario. Um, there are activity-based interventions as people are developing agitations. Once people are fully agitated, you're not going to be able to do much with them. Um, but if you see them starting to get a little bit distressed, then it may be that you can bring them into something they love. You know, baseball fans. You know, this is what the Cardinals are doing right now. Did you see the World Series? Um, hey, I've got a tape of that. Um, that sometimes will work for people who are just kind of building up. Um, for people who have um, agitation frequently, acupuncture, massage, and aromatherapy have been shown to be helpful. Um, and targeted caregiver training um, may reduce problem behavior. Uh, the geriatric um, conference group that I'm involved with actually had a conference last September, September 2014, on behavioral methods for agitation. And um, Pat Cronin's here to do a couple of the scenarios we did for that conference. OK, what we did for the man with the um, battle reenactments is um, we tried to distract him. Now, I had a huge advantage, because apparently I looked like his commanding officer. <laughs> I, I swear to god, I mean, he would call me Captain I, I don't remember it was Captain Smith. He called me Captain something. Um, and I would just go with it and say, soldier, you've done your job. Go back from the front, get some rest. And he would calm down. Um, now, unfortunately, when I wasn't there, the staff didn't have that advantage. Um, but we did want to look to make sure that there wasn't a CNA that looked like somebody who actually triggered one of these bad memories, or that um, there wasn't anything that we were doing that made it look more like a battle scene. Um, I don't think we really made a lot of progress. This guy actually developed pneumonia and declined fairly quickly. Um, but uh, initially, this was very helpful. And then subsequently, as he worsened, we didn't really need it. He couldn't get around. <clears throat> I don't know if I look that much like him. I have a feeling if he had a chance to study it, it might not be a good idea. <laughs> No, they didn't. But that's a reasonable idea. If they had a picture of the captain, that would have been really helpful. Yeah. All right. Other examples. Um, I was at Broadmoor. I'm, I'm the medical director at Assisted Living at Broadmoor now. And I have a patient who was just about ready to go to the locked Alzheimer's unit. She was wandering too much. She'd actually been caught outside the building a couple of times. Um, one time she was in. Um, one of the CNA's cars, he had, he had left his car unlocked when he had brought some lunch in, and he didn't leave the keys in, for, thank goodness. But she actually went into the driver's seat and, and put down her purse on the passenger side, so they knew she had been there, um, and I think would have started the car up. Um, but she didn't. So I found her wandering the hall, looking towards the door, um, and knew what was going on, so I, I you know, walked up and engaged her and started talking to her and then um, started walking, hey, are you going to your room? You know, we ended up walking back in that direction. So, yes, not only did I distract her, but I kind of led her a little bit in the direction I wanted her to go and um, that gave the staff enough time to be aware that she was going to try to bolt. Um, sometimes you have to separate two patients. We've had two this past month at Broadmoor who are fighting over a baby doll um, because one of the patients who just started in, in the memory care unit, the locked unit, is convinced that this other woman's doll is hers. Well, finally the niece was able to persuade her that it wasn't and it's better now. But in the meantime, uh, they came to blows once and 
the staff has to separate them when that gets started. Um, there's a lot of patients who will call out, I'm not in my home, I want to go home. And the best response to that is to say, we're going to get you home soon. We can't do it right at this moment, or your son's delayed to come get you, or you know something along that line. Um, if there's a CNA that has a PTSD association, you know maybe a woman was abused, and the big burly CNA looks like the guy who abused her. That's not a good idea to assign him for her. Um, and if, as soon as you figure that out, then you avoid that assignment. Sometimes a patient is agitated because you're trying to give care. That is actually really, really common. And the easiest thing to do for that is to delay it, not be on a rigid schedule. Um, at one point, NHC was using um, the night shift to do baths. What a terrible idea. I mean, you know, I mean you're screwing up their day-night cycle. You're causing all this activity at night when they're most likely to be confused. Um, so they stop that real quick. Um, but Often, even during the day, you come up, you approach them, they don't want any part of it. If you insist, you're more likely to create agitation and aggression. But if you say, okay, Mr. Smith, that's fine, I'll come back in a little bit, and you do that, then it's very possible that in an hour, they've got no problem with doing it. And you do want to remove restraints. Now, what restraints do is they decrease the incidence slightly of minor injury and increase the incidence of major injury pretty significantly. Did a geriatrics conference on that. You don't want to do that. And remember that a Foley is a one-point restraint, and an IV can be a one-point restraint. So you want to get rid of those if you can. What I'll often do for our hospitalized patients who I see getting delirious is we'll INT their IV, and then we'll wrap it at night so they don't see it, and they don't feel it. And that way, we can usually use it the next day. It doesn't always work, but it's a reasonable thing to do. OK, that's the evidence-based part of this. Now, there is a good evidence base for behavioral measures, but the actual doing it, you kind of have to see it a little bit, because it's not intuitive. So Pat, you ready? The scene here is that I'm in my house, my wife is out, and my father-in-law is coming to visit. He's in assisted living. Hey, Pat. Come on hey, in. James. Good to see you. Is my daughter here? No, no. Judy's not here. She's out shopping. Where's your wife? Um, she's out shopping. Huh? Come on in. Sit down. Did I park all right? Yeah, that looks okay. I mean, nobody comes on this cul-de-sac anyway. It's a nice view. Yeah, I really like seeing the, uh, the mountain out through the front. Have you been here a long, this is your first time here, isn't it? Uh, no, 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 this is, this is where we've been for a little bit. Huh. I think we moved in last year. Sit down. Huh. This, this isn't your chair, is it? No, 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 go ahead, sit down. I don't, I don't want to sit in your chair. Oh, no, I'm not that way. This, this isn't your chair. No. So, um, what's happening over at Broadmoor? You doing okay? Yeah, 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 it's good. W where, where's the dog? Oh, um, got bad news there. Pat. What? Um, Skippy died yesterday. Oh dear God, really? He had been getting like cough oh, and sort of breath, and, um, huh. and he, I think, had pneumonia. Oh. We we buried him last night. I'm not I'm not in your chair, am I, Skip? No. Is this no. your chair? No, no, no. I, I, I never sit in someone else's chair. Well, I'm glad. This this all right here? Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So anyway. where, where, where's the dog? I'd like to see the dog. Oh, well, um, um, Pat, the dog died yesterday. Oh, dear God, no. Yeah. What? What did he die of? He, he was sick. He, he got... Oh, God. He got congested in his chest. Oh. I'm not in your chair, am I? No. This isn't your chair. I, people no. don't like it when you no, sit it's in... Not.
so. If I could see the dog, that would be nice. I like the dog. Uh, yeah, the dog died yesterday. Oh, dear God, no. I, I asked that, didn't I? Didn't I ask yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, I, I must. I must be sitting in your chair. No. This isn't your. I, I, no, I, I, I sometimes sit in someone in the wrong chair. Yeah, no, it's not my chair, Pat. I think I should go. Okay. I think I should go. Yeah. It's very pretty, though. Very, yeah. very pretty. Okay, so that is the wrong way to deal with someone with dementia. You don't pretend that they can totally remember and understand everything that you do. Okay? And all I did by answering his questions reasonably was make him more and more agitated and upset. Okay? So, let's do the replay. Uh, perhaps a better way to deal with it. Hello? Hey, Pat. Come on in. Hi, James. So, where's my daughter? She's out shopping. Huh? And your wife? She's out shopping. Huh. I thought they'd be here. Yeah, yeah. Well, come on in, sit down. Very beautiful here. Yeah, isn't it? I did, love this view. Did you just move today? No, not today, but I love this view. It's really pretty. It's very pretty. I'm glad we're here. Is, is this your chair? No, it's not. Go ahead and sit down. Hey, Pat, I've got something that I think you'll really like. What? Not, this isn't your chair, is it? No, it's not. Um, there's, um, you know, it's Christmas season. And Judy and I got the DVD on It's a Wonderful Life. I know that's your favorite Christmas movie. Yeah, I love that movie. And I love it, too. Do you want to watch it? That would be. Uh, you know what I'd like for? I'd like to see the dog. Oh, the dog's at the groomer. Oh. Oh, well. Well, let's, let's go ahead and put the movie in. All right. Huh. Anyway, those are behavioral techniques. Basically, I'm deflecting things that are harmful and are likely to make him upset. Um, and I'm also distracting into things that he would find enjoyable that relate to a past that he found pleasurable. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes. The question is, um, is the priority more reality um, and reorientation, or is it more uh, dealing with the agitation. You know, basically, for the correct answer to that is if somebody's very early dementia or non-cognitive impairment, reality testing and reorientation is probably the best way. If you start getting somebody more towards mild to moderate dementia, which he's demonstrating, still driving, but memory's very bad, then agitation is a more significant concern and, and reorientation is not generally very effective. So what you have to do is kind of recognize what stage you're dealing with and what the dangers are at that stage, and then behave accordingly. Good question. Anything else? <laughs> well, at this point, I think you could make a real good argument. <laughs> because Please. essentially, what's recommended for driving is that the state intermittently test people, and I believe that's starting to be put into place in Tennessee. At this point, I actually have to write a letter to the Department of Transportation suggesting that they retest somebody, and I've done that only a couple of times. Uh, but there was one guy who had a very rapidly progressive, I assume it was Louis Body, um, who nearly ran his wife over in a parking lot. Um, and I think part of it was behavioral, and part of it was just he couldn't drive anymore. Um, I wrote a letter for him. <laughs> that was the last one I've written. Okay. Anything else? Oh, yes, that is uh, the questions about the anger that patients have who have dementia and are restricted from driving. That is absolutely true. Um, it's one of the most unpleasant visits that we have. But it's almost never done just me and the patient. I mean, it's almost always two or three family members there with me. Um, we do the same kind of thing. We kind of deflect it and say, hey, you know, um, your family's here. They're absolutely willing to get you everywhere you want to go. Um, it, you do the best you can with it. But yeah, that's about the meanest thing you can do other than taking them from their house. I think the 
car is number two. Okay. Anything else? Do you want to see anything else acted out? I'm not much of an actor, but Pat is good. <laughs> what we just did is uh, my father-in-law, this was an act actual replication of the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, my dog of 10 years had died on Thanksgiving Day. And he came to this cabin, which is very close to where he lives in Franklin, North Carolina. He's about 82. And he, it started uh, like two years ago when he kept asking about the chair he was sitting in at my home here in Johnson City. And a lot of guys have that kind of domination of my seat, my chair, dad's chair kind of thing. So I didn't pay much attention. He's that kind of old-fashioned sort of guy. And I thought, oh, yes, he's concerned about whose chair are we in. So I sort of said, no, no, we sit anywhere we like. But then five minutes later, it would, he would ask me if, I, if he was in my chair. And then I thought, why the hell is he asking me that? The problem is you start dealing with people as if it's rational. So my dog had just died. And he said, Where, where's your dog? He likes my dog. And I just buried him. And I said, oh, he died yesterday, Skip. He got genuinely distressed. And then he asked about the chair again. And, and then a normal conversation could happen. You say, well, the politics are, you know, he's talking about Trump or whatever. And you go, oh, yeah, how about that? And then he asked about the chair again. And you go, wait a minute. <laughs> but we had settled the chair. And then he asked about the dog again. And that's where I made a huge mistake. I answered again. I said, the dog died. And then he had the, the grief all over again. You would have thought I would have gotten it right on the third event. I didn't. Uh, but afterwards, my wife and his wife, they drove to church two Sundays ago. He came out of church, took the car, and came home and left his wife at the church. And that's a pretty recurring event now. He, he drives well, but he doesn't remember who was with him or who he should be bringing home. So, you know, you deal with this first as a family rather than seeking, if you have family, rather than seeking medical help. And uh, so now we're beginning to do more of let's watch the news. Let's let me show you some pictures of the dog. Actually, the dog is that the groomer would have been the right answer, and he would have dropped it. Or even if he asked it again, he just keeps saying he's at the groomers. But we 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 made that mistake. Yeah. Yeah, but it's transient. So what you say is, yeah, he does look like Skippy, but you know, remember Skippy's at the groomer. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna have a problem from that. Yes. I'm sorry. Okay. I thought there was somebody behind you. We actually have a scenario for I, that. I was going to say, yeah. that was wonderful. Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah, that is a tough question. Okay, I'm the son. Um, I'm in the uh, downstairs, and Dad's coming down the steps. How you doing, Jim? Doing fine. How are you, Pat? I'm good. I'm, uh, I'm going to go get uh, some uh, stuff at the drugstore. Oh, Pat, uh, don't you remember your car is going to be worked on? Um, the garage already has the keys. Well, let me have your keys. Um, I'll use your car. There. Um, you have the keys to your car. Yeah. Um, my car isn't working very well. Well, going to get me to the Walgreens? I'm just going to the Walgreens. Uh, Two I blocks away. Huh? I don't think I would recommend that. Why not? It's a little tricky. I'll, I'll, I'll take you, OK, because I can get it to work. I'd like to drive myself. I understand, but it's, it's a little tricky right well, now. When is my car going to be ready? Um, I think in about a week. I didn't know they took it. I don't they remember taking it. taken it yet. It's out, it's out there. But, um, well, then I, I have the keys. Why can't I drive it? Well, they said not to drive it. Well, <laughs> it's my car. 
um, bad, I, I really recommend you don't do that because they said that the engine might burn up. They don't know the car as well as I do. It's got an oil leak. When did that happen? Um, last week. Do you not remember? I, I think I want to try it out. Well, um, Pat, why don't you let me take you? I mean, that'd be, that'd be easier, and then you don't run any risk of blowing the engine out. Please. All right. Okay. Come on, let's go. I think I would have fought more. <laughs> <laughs> I one, don't know. I don't know. I mean, one of the effects with that is usually to have a set of keys that doesn't work. You got a yeah. set of keys that look just like the right key, and you go out and you try to start the car, and it doesn't work. Right. Well, what the frustration we, with that will defer. One of the things we suggested was to take the coil wire off, um, but um, in this scenario, I hadn't done that yet. No. So, this was very early in the problem, yes. <laughs> and Dad was, <laughs> Dad was interested in getting going. Yeah, he sure was. <laughs> All, right. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. You know, yeah. So the question is about taking care of the caregiver who's just like stressed out to the max and but still trying to take care of their parent. Um, actually, what I found most helpful for that is a support group. Um, the Alzheimer's Association has multiple um, support groups in town. There's actually one at Broadmoor coming up next week. There's a recurrent one at Courtyard Assisted Living, um, and that's often very helpful. They start seeing what's normal in the situation, you know, what they can do, what other people have done. It's very helpful. Yes? I, I'm sure that's true. But in that case, you'd have the coil wire off. <laughs> so, guaranteed or they wouldn't have had a car in the first place, I suspect. Okay, I've got a summary slide. Thank you so Thanks, much, James. Pat. Okay, so avoid correcting memory errors as much as you can. I got kind of borderline with the scenario since it was extemporaneous and say, don't you remember that your car had an oil leak? Um, if you do it in the suggestion of the way that you expect them to remember, it's not quite as agitating as saying, you don't remember that, um, but be careful. Um, correct misidentification, that happens all the time. We do a scenario sometimes where the older demented patient mistakes the daughter for his wife. That's a pretty uncomfortable one to watch. Um, and don't mention death or estrangement in someone who's likely to get agitated. Just have a reason that they're not there. Um, before agitation really develops is when you're most likely to be able to deflect this. So that's what you're working at. You know it's coming, you know it's a risk, deflect it early, and it's much more likely to be effective. And go to things that they really, really still like. So the Royals just won the World Series, that's your team. Um, and if you can find out a cause of the agitation, by all means, work with that. Uh, though, unfortunately, my experience is that often you can't. Okay, so summary. Meds don't work very well, but that tends to be what people do. Uh, behavioral measures are first line, and behavioral measures can be taught. So that's my bottom line. Any, any other questions?